All right, as uh, we're uh, getting uh, Mohammed's uh, presentation queued up, uh, welcome uh, to our CIFAR uh, event uh, uh, for the day. It's my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Mohammed Abdel Mohsen, an associate professor at the Wistar Institute and an uh, adjunct associate professor at the University of Pennsylvania. And he leads a research team that merges glycoimmunology and virology to study how the host glycosylation machinery regulates immunological signals during viral infections, including HIV. Their work, published in over 80 papers in the last few years, uh, has yielded several mechanistic insights uh, uh, and glycoimmunotherapeutic tools uh, to address a range of, of, of immune and or aging related diseases, including HIV and COVID-19. It's also fitting that Mohammed uh, is returning here to UCSF on a day where we are recognizing uh, our CIFAR scholars. Uh, Mohammed has deep ties uh, to our community here at UCSF. Uh, after starting his professional career as a virologist uh, for the WHO Regional Reference Lab for polio in Egypt, he moved to uh, San Francisco and began working in the laboratory of core virology with our beloved uh, late colleague, Terry Liegler, uh, after whom our ARI mentoring award is named. Mohammed quickly distinguished himself as a brilliant, creative, uh, and generous colleague and transitioned to a postdoctoral fellowship with Satish Palai at Vitalant. Um, where he unsurprisingly uh, uh, was uh, incredibly productive and successful. Indeed, he was a prior recipient of our CIFAR's Excellence in Basic Science Award in 2015 uh, before Wistar and Penn whisked him away. Um, uh, we're, we're still angry at them for that, Mohammed. Um, and on a personal note, uh, I have a lot of colleagues around the world who, like Mohammed, are brilliant and creative. Um, uh, but few uh, who are as kind and generous, uh, and uh, that really makes a difference. And so we are really lucky to have him uh, uh, here at UCSF, uh, and uh, uh, Penn and Wistar is really lucky to have him as are all of his mentees. Uh, so welcome uh, back to UCSF, Mohammed, uh, and uh, thank you for coming. Thank you very much, Peter, for this very kind introduction, and I'm very excited to be here today. As Peter mentioned, I'm not new here to UCSF. In fact, uh, yeah, I spent about 10 years here between UCSF and the Talent Research Institute between 2007 and 2017, where I did my PhD studies, my postdoctoral training with Thierry Legler, Satish Bilai, and others. Before, in 2017, I moved to the Western Institute in Philadelphia, to start our independent research program where we focus in the intersection between three fields. We work at the intersection between virology, immunology, and glycobiology. And it's pretty obvious why we need to understand immunological functions during viral infection. But usually the question is, what is glycobiology? Why should we care? And how studying glycobiology can help us better understand immunological functions during viral infections. And I like usually to start my presentation with this very simple fact that there is not a single living cell on earth that is not covered with a heavy, dense layer of glycans, sugars on its cell surface. It looks like a forest on the surface of the cell, as you can see in these images. And some of these glycans get secreted into the circulation on glycoproteins. And perhaps in the last decade or so, there is a lot of advances in this emerging field of glycobiology or glycoimmunology that show it that these glycans are biologically active molecules and they can drive and mediate several immunological functions during many diseases, including cancer and other diseases. In fact, there is a lot of interesting work is being done on cancer and glycoimmunology as we speak, such as you definitely need to check out. Some of this work actually got Dr. Karen Bretosi here in Stanford the Nobel Prize in Chemistry in 2022. But not as much work is being done in how glycans can modulate immunological functions during infectious diseases, including viral infections and HIV. Of course, the glycans on HIV, the virus itself, has been heavily studied for the last 30, 40 years, mainly for vaccine developing purpose. But on the other hand, the role of the host, not the virus, the host glycans in mediating immunological functions during HIV infection is something that has been heavily ignored despite its potential for therapeutic application. And I become interested in this topic toward the end of my postdoctoral training here at UCSF. And I was fortunate 
to actually receive a pilot funds from the UCSF CFAR back in 2015. And that's actually was very instrumental for me because it allowed me to generate my first independent preliminary data that I used for getting my first NIH grant, which allowed me to move to Worcester and start uh, our program. So that is actually one of the many reasons why presenting here today holds a great value for me, again, among many different reasons. But again, we still work on this question, how glycomic interaction can modulate immunological functions and inflammation during viral infection. We work in several viral infection, but we obviously focus on HIV infection and, uh, and my presentation today will also focus on HIV infection. And this work in our lab can be divided into three interconnected areas of research. In one area, we focus on the glycans on the cell surface of infected cells. And in the other area, we focus on the gut glycosylation. And I will tell you in a minute why the gut glycosylation could be very important during viral infection, including HIV infection. And last but not least, we do a lot of work on glycans and circulating glycoproteins. And obviously for the time today, I will only be able to give you a quick overview in each one of those sections, but I will try while I'm doing so to highlight the several publication we had in each one topic, so you can refer to it if you want to know more about it. And I will start by telling you about the work we are doing on the cell surface glycosylation of HIV infected cells. And for me to do so, to do so, I, I need to first introduce to you a concept called glycoimmune negative checkpoints. And I'm sure many of you or all of you are quite familiar with classic immune negative checkpoints that works by protein-protein interactions. Like for an example, the protein BD1 on immune cells bind to another protein BDL1 on cancer cells. And this binding send an inhibitory signal to the immune cells and allow cancer cells to evade immune surveillance. And obviously breaking this interaction is the essence of cancer immunotherapy. But again, recently it become clear there is another class of immune negative checkpoints that works by binding to sugars, glycans, instead of protein, and hence the name glycoimmune negative checkpoints. And again, let me start this part by telling you that is every immune cells expressed on its surface several sugar binding proteins are also known as lectins. Some of those lectins have an inhibitory domain. So when they bind to their sugar ligand, that can send an inhibitory signal to this immune cells. And that's why it was showing that is, it was found recently that is cancer cells make sure to decorate themselves with this sugar ligand of this inhibitory lectin in order to bind to this inhibitory lectin, send an inhibitory signal to the immune cells and evade immune surveillance. And since this realization, there is a lot of interest and work in developing approaches to break these glycan lectin interactions in order to enhance the susceptibility of cancer cell, cell for immune mediated clearance. In fact, this is actually the work that is Dr. Karen Brutosi, the Nobel Prize winner of 2022 is working on, is developing a novel approach to break this interaction for cancer cells. But what we were doing in our lab, and actually that is with the basis of my UCSF CFAR violet is asking a little bit different question. Do virally infected cells utilize a similar mechanism in order to evade immune surveillance? In other words, do they also decorate themselves with this sugar that is allows them to bind to this inhibitory lectins and evade immune surveillance? And we indeed did a full glycomic analysis on the cell surface of HIV infected cells and compare it to the glycome of HIV uninfected cells. And taking a long story short, because this was published a few years ago in this paper that was led by Florent Colomb, a previous boss doc in our lab, we indeed found that is HIV infected transcriptionally active cells in vivo from human have a glycomic signature to them that can distinguish them from HIV uninfected cells and HIV infected transcriptionally inactive cells. And one of the features of this glycomic signature is an upregulation of a sugar called sialic acid on the surface of these cells. And that was quite interesting for us. And the reason why this was quite interesting for us is because this sialic acid is the sugar ligand of a family of glycoimmune negative checkpoints. I mentioned two earlier, this family called siglic. So siglic is a family of lectin sugar binding proteins that have an inhibitory domain and expressed in, a, in the surface of many immune cells like natural killer cells, NK cells, and myeloid cells. And when a, a cell have high level of sialic acid as um, HIV infected cells in this case, bind to these siglic, 
that send an inhibitory signal to this immune cells and allow these cells that have high level of sialic acid like HIV infected cells to evade immune surveillance. And through actually a lot of work that is, most of it is already published and some of it is yet to be published that is uh, done by Samson Adeniji and Shalini Sine and other two postdoc in our lab, we indeed found that is HIV infected cells utilize it's a glycan coating that is enriched with sialic acid in order to bind to specific siglic, siglic three, siglic seven and siglic nine on the surface of natural killer cells in key cells and myeloid cells. And this binding inhibits the immune functions of these cells and allows these virally infected cells to escape immune surveillance. And by you know, recognizing this novel mechanism and how virally infected cells might evade immune surveillance again, namely by expressing high level of sialic acid on their surface that allows them to bind to cyclic and immune cells, we start asking questions like, can we design a selective approach, an approach that is, can remove this excess sialic acid only from the surface of HIV infected cells to enhance their immune susceptibility? And we have actually over the last couple of years developed several approach, but I will share with you one of those approach, approaches that is we published on in this paper a couple of years ago, where we thought to use an enzyme called sialidase. And the enzyme sialidase is capable of removing, cutting sialic acid from the surface of cells. So if you treat cells with sialidase, it will remove the sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells. But obviously it will also remove sialic acid from the surface of HIV uninfected cells. So we thought we can conjugate this sialidase to an HIV specific antibody. With the idea here is this sialidase here represented by this pigment shape when it's conjugated to HIV specific antibody. The HIV specific antibody will steer the sialidase to the surface of HIV infected cells that hopefully uh, expressing viral antigen by stimulation or by stopping antiretroviral therapy. And this will allow the sialidase to remove the excess sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells with that and enhance the susceptibility of these cells for immune mediated clearance without it much impacting HIV uninfected cells. So in this paper, we went ahead and indeed made several of this conjugate. We use an HIV BNAP, broadly neutralizing antibodies. And we conjugated several of this BNAP to the sialidase. And we first asked it, does this conjugate really remove or do these conjugates really remove sialic acid from the surface of HIV infected cells without impacting HIV uninfected cells? And here is an example of an, uh, a result in a flu cytometry experiment where we mix it HIV infected and uninfected cells. And we treated them here in the right with the conjugate or the antibody alone in the left. And the Y axis here is the level of sialic acid. And you can see without it, the conjugate, both HIV infected and uninfected cells have similar level of sialic acid, but the conjugate dramatically removes the level or reduce the level of sialic acid only from the HIV infected cells without impacting HIV uninfected cells. And obviously the more important question here, does this selective removal of sialic acid enhance the susceptibility of these cells, HIV infected cells for immune mediated clearance? And as you can imagine in this paper and other work that is yet to be published, we have tested this six ways to Sunday, but I'm just showing you one one example of this experiment here where we um, mix it HIV infected and HIV uninfected cells after staining the HIV uninfected cells with a red dye and HIV infected cells with a green dye. And you can see this here in this live imaging staining, or you can also see this here in this bar graph, the number of the cell. We can add to this mixture in key cells, natural killer cells, and you can see the number of green cells, the HIV infected cells is reduced by about twofold because NK cells will kill HIV infected cells without much impacting HIV uninfected cells. We can add an isotype control and nothing much happens. We can add two different concentration of an HIV BNAB and the twofold becomes fivefold, sixfold because obviously the BNAB will elicit what is called antibody mediated cytotoxicity, ADCC. And you can clearly see the number of green cells, the infected cells is reduced as you go from left to right. And you would wonder if there is even more space for the conjugate to work. But indeed, when we use a similar con concentration of the conjugate instead of the BNAB, the five, six fold become 25, 50 fold. And you can see almost all of the green cells were wiped out from the culture. But very importantly, with not much impact on HIV uninfected cells here in red, they are still happy and alive. So that is true for inky cells. You can see this in this graph. 
with the x-axis is antibody concentration and the y-axis is NK-mediated cytotoxicity. Again, it's HIV-infected cells. At any concentration, the conjugate here in white help NK cells to kill HIV-infected cells much better than the antibody, the BNAB alone. But that is also true for many other immune cells. It's true for monocyte-specific killing, neutrophil, BBMCs. Every time we conjugate BNAB with the sialidase, that, that dramatically enhance the ability of this BNAB to kill, to help immune cells to kill HIV-infected cells. And you might wonder if that is something specific for HIV, and the answer is no. We have actually observed this in many other viral infections. For an example, uh, Britima Sini here, another postdoc in our lab, just published this study where she described a similar phenomena by which SARS-CoV-2 infected cells use in order to evade immune surveillance by NK cells. And if you are interested in this topic more, I will actually recommend for you to read this review article we uh, wrote a few months ago where we describe how sialic acid cyclic interaction could actually play a very important role in modulating a balance between immune tolerance and immune activation during several viral infections. But that is just one quick example of how studying glycomic could be very important and could allow us to understand the totally novel mechanism by which virally infected cells evade immune surveillance. And very importantly, how this information could be useful, could be applicable, and could allow us to develop proof of concept immunotherapeutic tools to break this interaction and enhance immune susceptibility of these virally infected cells. So this actually end my first example and led me to the second area of investigation in our lab, which mainly focus on the gut. And perhaps many of you don't know that is the gut is the most glycosylated area in our body with our epithelial cells in the uh, gut covered with sugars. The mucus in our gut is basically sugar, like a protein backbone, but mainly sugar. Uh, the bacteria and fungus in our microbiome is also heavily covered with sugars. And these glycans plays a very important role in regulating the relationship between the gut and its microbiota, which obviously uh, very important for regulating immunity during many viral infections. And this is, has been shown outside of the viral infection in fields like IBD and inflammatory bowel diseases and others. And we have started investigating it for viral infection. And indeed, over the last few years, we had series of a pilot study where we show it that is led actually by Lila Girona, scientist in our lab, where we found that is this glycan interaction in the gut could play a very important role in regulating inflammasome and inflammation during HIV infection in the gut. We also showed that is important in regulating inflammation during acute severe COVID-19. And even recently in a study heavily, uh, we heavily collaborated with folks here in UCSF, Michael Beluso, Tim Henrich, Steve Deeks, and other, we found it could be important also in regulating inflammation during the long-term complications of uh, SARS-CoV-2 or also known as long COVID or BASC. But these pilot studies over the last couple of years has, have prompted us to start doing a, a several multi-omic investigation to try to understand how gut uh, interactions and inflammation can be related to long-term disease outcome during viral infection with a focus obviously in glycans. And we're doing this for HIV and SARS-CoV-2 and other viral infection. But in this slide here, I will highlight one of these multi-omic investigation that we're doing with, in collaboration with Dr. Ali Kish, the head of GI department in Russian University in Chicago, where we collecting samples from 40 people living with HIV on long-term subversive therapy. They are on art for more than five years and uh, matched uh, people without HIV. And we collecting samples from their ileum, colon, blood, and stool. And we know obviously people living with HIV, even after long-term suppressive therapy, have a state of gut leakiness and a translocation of microbes, both bacteria and fungus from their gut to the blood, which can cause uh, chronic inflammation. But usually we measure this by measuring markers in the plasma for gut permeability or gut integrity. But we want to take advantage of actually having ileum and colon biopsies in order to measure this intestinal permeability or integrity directly. And we did so by measuring the level of what's called tight junction protein, which is a protein that is keeps the gut intact. So you will want more of those protein to prevent gut leakiness and increasing gut integrity. So we do that by immunohistochemistry. Uh, so you can see here, for an example, we measure this tight junction protein called ZW1 here in green. And you can see here in an example, 
of an ileum from a person not living with HIV, and you can clearly see an, a dramatic reduction in the level of this tight junction protein in an ileum from a person living with HIV, even after long-term suppressive therapy. So indeed, this lower level of tight junction protein, or in other words, increase in intestinal permeability in people living with HIV, as you would expect, correlated with how much bacteria, how much fungus we can measure in the plasma of this individual, more microbial translocation, which is when this bacteria and fungus translocate to the blood, they being recognized by the immune system, by myeloid cells in particular, causing immune inflammation, which is again, the, more, the lower tight junction protein correlated with more microbial translocation, which correlated with more inflammation and immune activation. But what actually, which is all expected, but what actually, uh, got our attention is when we decided to measure biological age, which is how, how, what is the age of your body compared to the age in your birth certificate. And we do that by measuring telomer lens or measuring several epigenetic clock of aging. And as you can imagine, when we recruited this individual, we made sure that is the people living with HIV here in red have the identical chronological age of the people without HIV. But we, and that is their chronological age, the age in their birth certificate. But when you look at the rate of acceleration in biological age, the body age, and here I'm showing you an example from the blood and the ileum, and how to read this graph zero means there is no acceleration in biological age, meaning that is your body age is identical to your, uh, the age in your birth certificate. If you have lower than zero, that means there is a deceleration in biological age. Your biological age is lower than your chronological age. And obviously that is something good and everyone would like to have this phenotype. If you have more than zero, that will mean there is an acceleration in biological age. Your body might be a few years older than your chronological age. And you can see that as people without HIV, their median acceleration or deceleration is zero. That's we mean randomly half of them have some acceleration in biological age and some of them have deceleration about like fivefold the plus or minus five years of plus or minus. While people living with HIV, almost all of them in the, in the wrong side of this equation, highly statistically significant. And we can calculate that between about six to seven years acceleration in biological age, uh, even after five years of antiretroviral therapy. And that's interesting, but what's also interesting, we found a negative correlation between intestinal integrity. So this is a level of tight junction protein. So the lower amount of tight junction protein will be, the lower amount of tight junction protein will mean, oh, no, it's not, oh, okay. is more intestinal permeability. So the more intestinal permeability is the more acceleration and biological aging, which is, I thought is a very interesting phenomenon because we collected this sample with a multi-omic investigation in mind we recently finished then done a full microbiome analysis, metabolic analysis, glycomic analysis, obviously, among other omic, in order to try to understand the mechanistic links between intestinal permeability and accelerated biological aging in people living with HIV, which is obvious, which honestly will not only be important in people living with HIV, it will be very important for a range of aging associated diseases that is characterized by a chronic inflammation or people call inflammation aging that is mediated at least in part by intestinal permeability. So hopefully next time I present to you, I can actually dedicate a full presentation on this project because we found a lot of interesting information on links between a specific microbial species, metabolite, glycoma, and whatnot, and this phenomena. But as you can see, as actually that is, takes me to my third and last part. As you can see, our work in the gut have took us to this field of accelerated biological aging, which is in those studies, we measure by telomere lens or epigenetic clock of aging, which requires cells. It's not very trivial to measure and made us wonder if we can measure something in the circulation that can tell us about accelerated biological aging more simply and that we can use in those study in the gut. And obviously we will look in the glycans because that's what we like. And indeed I will show you in my last part here, not only that we could identify a simple measure of accelerated biological aging in people living with HIV in the plasma, but that also we found that is this marker are not just a marker of aging, they can drive immune dysfunction in these uh, people living with HIV. And this marker I will talk to you about in the next few minutes are the glycans on bulk antibody, IgG. And I'm sure, of course, all of you know that is IgG main function is neutralized and antigen, including viral antigen. But they do much more than that, including they can engage many immune cells to elicit important innate immune function. 
And even recently, it become clear that this bulk IgG can elicit a potent anti or pro-inflammatory response. And through a lot of work by uh, uh, Ravitch in, in Rockefeller, he found that is what determine if an antibody have an, it can elicit an anti or pro-inflammatory response is the sugar on them. And again, you can see here the sugar called sialic acid here represented by a verbal diamond. Oh, sorry. Yeah, verbal diamond here is, and it's called sialic acid, is anti-inflammatory. And as the antibody lose sialic acid, it moves from an anti-inflammatory phenotype to blue inflammatory phenotype. Another very important sugar here is galactose, represented here by a yellow circle. This is also a very potent anti-inflammatory glycan. And as, and as the antibody loses galactose, it moves from an anti-inflammatory to blue inflammatory phenotype. And they usually those sialic acid and galactose are anti-inflammatory because as I mentioned, too, they can bind to inhibitory receptor in myeloid cells. And by losing those glycans, you lose this anti-inflammatory cascade. But what's important in a large studies from Europe that did not include people living with HIV, it was showing that is these glycans and bulk IgG correlate with the development of several aging and inflammation associated diseases like cardiovascular diseases, neurological impairments and whatnot. I will show you one example of this paper here, which is again done in a large European cohort, I think like more than 12,000 donor. Again, none of them living with any chronic disease and found that these glycans could be in a very good marker for uh, chronological and biological age. And I selected a couple of examples to show you from this paper. For an example, this glycan here is pro-inflammatory because it does not have the yellow circle. It does not have the variable diamond. So it's putting it into the pro-inflammatory side of the equation. And you can see here, as we're getting older, you can see age in the x-axis. As we're getting older, we accumulate this pro-inflammatory glycan. And it's interestingly, we accumulating them differently, male as in female. You can see male accumulating this glycan in a steady, steady base, while uh, women accumulating them is lower until certain age, looks like about 45, 50, so probably have something to do with menopause and sex hormone. And there is a dramatic accum acceleration in the accumulation of this pro-inflammatory glycan to reach the same level of men or even surpass it. The opposite happened with anti-inflammatory glycans. Again, as we're getting older, which is one half galactose, uh, so the first example, the pro-inflammatory will be called agalactosylated with with galactose, and the other, second one will be galactosylated with galactose. You can see, as we're getting older, we usually uh, lose these glycans, and again, women actually increase them until certain age, and there is then a dramatic reduction in this anti-inflammatory glycan, again, around the age of many boys to reach to the same level of men or even surpass it. So obviously we're working in the field of HIV and we know people living with HIV, um, you know, have high uh, risk of developing aging and inflammation associated diseases. We wondered if living with HIV, even after long-term suppressive art, change or alter the base of the accumulation of this bro-aging glycans. And we, we recently actually looked at that, uh, Lila and I, in collaboration with Max and Weiss, in particular Todd Brown and Max and Weiss, to analyze the IgG glycom of about a thousand individuals. Half of them are women, half of them are men. Half of the men uh, and the women are living with HIV on long-term suppressive art. They had to be on antiretroviral therapy for at least five years with median CD4 of 750. So they are you're very well suppressed uh, people living with HIV. And they were matched almost one-to-one -to -one to, uh, by um, age, ethnicity, and BMI to the people without HIV from also uh, Max and Weiss. And indeed, we found that is living with HIV is associated with increase of several bro-aging glycans and reduction of several anti-aging glycans. For the time, I'm just showing you one example of what I showed you, agalactosylated glycans. Again, glycans with zawid galactose, that's why we call agalactosylated, which is associated with age. And you can see with in men and women with HIV, there is an increase of these bro-aging glycans compared to their almost identical counterparts. You can also see here in this uh, XY correlation between age and these glycan, that is, there is a positive correlation, which is as expected in both people living with HIV and without HIV. As I told you, as we're getting older, we accumulate this bro Asian glycan. But you can also see that is this, the slope if this correlation between people living with HIV and without HIV is different, people living with HIV have a steeper positive correlation between this 
glycans and age, meaning that is there is an acceleration in the accumulation of this bro-Asian glycan in people living with HIV, even that they are on long-term suppressive survey. And I, again, this is just one example, but we did find several bro-Asian glycan that is increased in people living with HIV compared to the control, several anti-Asian glycan that is significantly decreased in people living with HIV compared to the control. And then when we also try to find if there is a correlation between these glycans and inflammation, we indeed found a strong correlation. So this is a correlation heat map with red is a positive correlation and blue is a negative correlation. And you can see that bro-Asian glycan that is enriched in people living with, with HIV correlate positively with several inflammation marker. And the opposite happened with the anti-Asian glycans that are depleted in people living with HIV. In fact, we can actually take these glycans and use a machine learning model by, uh, made, uh, done by Dr. Shin Lu, the head of our biostatistical unit at Twister, in order to calculate the biological age based on the glycans from just simple uh, measurement in the plasma. And you can see here, this is the difference between biological age me measured by the glycans and chronological age. And again, you can see in the HIV, uh, people without HIV, the average or the median around zero, there is some acceleration, there is some deceleration. And again, people living with HIV, almost all of them, or many of them, most of them are in the wrong side of this equation. And again, we can calculate this by about 6.6 .6 years, which is, if you remember, very similar to what Ptolemy lens and epigenetic clock has calculated also to be the rate of acceleration in biological age compared to the chronological age in people living with HIV. So we know that is living with HIV even after long-term suppressive therapy is associated with accumulation of bro-Asian glycan that is correlate with more inflammation. And our next question now is we, we work, we're trying to work to find if this glycan alteration precedes the onset of aging and inflammation associated diseases in people living with HIV. And we're working with beaters and other in that try to characterize samples from longitudinal cohort to as well characterize medical or clinical outcome to again examine if this glycan alteration happened before the onset of these aging and inflammation associated diseases and hence can be used as a prognostic biomarker. In fact, we have some evidence that this might be true. In a very recent biolet exploratory study we did where we collected samples from cases and control, the cases are people living with HIV, again, and long-term suppressive antiretroviral therapy who eventually developed non ace defining GI cancers, anal cancer, colorectal cancer, and whatnot. And the control are age, gender, ethnicity matched, people with HIV who did not develop any cancer. And we were fortunate as we have samples, longitudinal samples going up to five to 10 years before the cases develop cancers. And, and you can see here in this volcano blot in the right here, oh, sorry, in the right here are glycans that increased five to 10 years in the people who will eventually get cancer five to 10 years later compared to the control. And in the left here, the glycan that are depleted in them. And again, you can clearly see a galactosylated glycan, the same glycan I show it you to be enriched in people living with HIV, correlate with more inflammation, is also enriched in people who will eventually get cancer five to 10 years, while something like salylated glycans, which is anti-inflammatory, is depleted. So that is promising, but we are obviously, it's very exploratory. We had only N of 10 cases, N of 13 control. And again, we're working with Beta and other to try to confirm or uh, validate, or this, validate this phenomena. But we have also used these glycomic marker of aging to predict another very important clinical outcome during HIV, which is how long does it take for the virus to rebound after you stop antiretroviral therapy? I'm sure all of you know that is uh, in the vast majority of people living with HIV, once you stop antiretroviral therapy, the virus would rebound very quickly within a few weeks, but this time is variable. And there is a lot of interest in our field now in defining something that is, can be measured before stopping antiretroviral therapy, that can predict time or probability of viral rebound. And we actually have applied this glycomic marker of aging into many cohort from ACTG in collaboration with Jonathan Lee and other, and some of this work is already published. And indeed we found that is the bro aging glycans can predict, as you expect, a faster time to viral rebound. And anti-aging glycans predict a, a delayed time to viral rebound. And this was interesting for us because this, gly this glycan, for an example, egalactosylated glycans predict 
faster than the viral rebound. So, for an, and that's what's interesting for us. Why this glycans is increased in people living with HIV? It correlates with more inflammation. It might even predict the onset of inflammation-associated disease. It might even predict uh, faster time to viral rebound and made us wonder it might have an, a, you know, a mechanistic functional significance. And my last, my next slide is my last slide where I will show you it's possible that this loss of the sugar, galactose, might actually decrease antiviral activity, which might ex explain some of its correlation with bad disease outcome. And this actually takes me to what I told you, that this antibody can do much more than just neutralizing a virus. And one of the things they do through their FC portion, they can engage with several innate immune cells to elicit important antiviral innate immune function. For an example, they can engage natural killer cells to elicit what is called antibody-dependent cellular cytotoxicity the ADCC. They can engage myeloid cells for phagocytosis. They can engage complement for ADCD. And these are very important innate immune function and controlling viral infection. And the ability of an antibody to elicit this function depends on many different factors, but glycosylation is indeed one of them. There is a lot of work in this sugar called focos, and it's known that is having focos and antibody dramatically decreases the, the ability of this antibody to elicit ADCC. But again, our data from clinical cohort focus on galactose, and galactose is not known if it's can impact this antiviral activity or not. So what we did is Angela Krugan, a previous um, graduate student in our lab, what she did, she used the glycoengineering method that this can take any antibody and glycoengineer it to what we, the glycoform we want. So she took an HIV B nap called 101074 and glycoengineered it to make two different glycoform. One, both of them have focus. That's why the name have F in them. Both of them have focus. So focus, which we know in fact, uh, antibody function is constant. But one of them do not have any galactose, that's why it's will call G0. And the other one have high level of galactose, that's why we'll call G2. And now we can use this to glycoform in examining its ability to elicit ADCC, ADCB, ADCD, which are routine assays in our lab. And for the time, I will just show you the data from ADCC, where you can see a different antibody concentration. The glycoform without galactose, which is in black lines here, elicit lower ADCC compared to the glycoform with galactose in orange here. And again, that what is predicting bad disease outcome and the orange is predicting good disease outcome. We can actually take this G2 form and remove even focose to make a glycoform called G2 without focose here in red, which is dramatically enhances the ability of this antibody to elicit ADCC. This is very interesting because it can explain some of our clinical data, but it's also very important because 101074, the wild type that is already being used to in clinical trial is similar to the black line its ability to elicit ADCC is already weak. And by just manipulating two sugars on it, you can go from something like 17% to almost 80% killing. So that's that's uh, interesting. So just for the time now, yeah, I just was hoping to show you a couple of examples and how uh, by studying glycans, we were able to find some potential biomarker for predicting some important disease that would come. And some of this biomarker actually have a functional significance and can allow us to hopefully design some immunotherapeutic tool that is, can allow us to um, hopefully modulate immunological function to enhance it during HIV infection or viral infection in general. And with that, I would like to go to my acknowledgement slide. So again, first and foremost, thanking all of the volunteer participants in, 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 in our study. As you can see, most if not all of our studies are heavily dependent on samples from donors. And we like to do uh, like you know, a project like this, which is something I learned here, working with the scope and options and, 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 and mini cohort and expanding this beyond since I moved to Worcester. Thanking uh, folks in our lab, that's I tried to highlight some of them along the presentation. Some of our collaborator within, within and, with, uh, and outside Worcester and some of our funders and thank you very much. Um, that was amazing. Is this on? Okay, that was amazing. Um, so, um, how how quickly did these uh, uh, um, uh, glycosylation changes happen? Like, say you 
you know, genetically, say you uh, modified the glycome of uh, an antibody like 101074 and you put it into someone with HIV, will, will it get modified uh, uh, before it does its thing or does it, does it remain um, a fucosylated? Uh, yeah. Or whatever? No, that's an excellent question. And there is two uh, possible uh, topics here. First, how quickly does it happen after HIV infection, which is something actually we are investigating now, trying to get samples from people who treated early with early R to see if how long does it take a person without R to impact how glycosylation happened. We have some evidence that this might be true. The earlier you treat, the less long-term glycomic alteration you will have. And the second part, what if you will give actually an antibody from outside? And that is actually bring us to why this glycosylation even happen, glycosylation changes happen. So we think, or we do have some data, that the reason why this glycosylation alteration happen in people living with HIV is because there is high level of glycan degrading enzyme in the plasma of this individual. So it's actually one of those glycan degrading enzyme is very interesting. It's called beta-gal. The beta-gal is a glycan that makes something galactosylated galactosylate and beta gal is being used a lot in science but not as a glycosylation modifying enzyme it's being used as a marker of aging so as a cell getting older senescent they produce a lot of beta gal people use this as a marker to know if these cells has become senescent now people living with HIV have high level of these glycan degrading enzyme in the circulation we measure that and and this le high level correlate with lower level of uh, galactose and or more e galactosylation. So perhaps, yeah, if you were to give this antibody in vitro, maybe this enzyme will modify this antibody to make it bad again. And it's probably better we, we should try to find a way to prevent this beta gal from being secreted, which is something we're working on. Other questions? Uh, 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 Philip? <laughs> I mean, my we have a question about a microphone battery. Uh, <laughs> do you know anything about microphone batteries? <laughs> Thanks. Amazing talk. So I, I'm trying to reconcile the first part of your talk with the last part. Um, and you kind of got into the mechanism a little bit of how these antibodies might be changing in the circulation. But in the first bit, you told us these cells might have more sialic acid mm -hmm. on them. Uh, I don't know. So two questions. Is it just the HIV infected cells that have more sialic acid or is it all the cells? And how do you reconcile that with, you know, there's this enzyme running around that's chopping off the sialic acids of the antibodies, presumably, but but not the cells themselves. So how do you reconcile the difference between you see between the cell surface and the antibodies? Oh, that's an excellent question. And this enzyme will not only remove this glycan from an antibody, they will remove it from cells. So in fact, the cell that is not infected with HIV have lower level of sialic acid. It's very interesting. The cells have HIV transcriptionally active. They have higher level of sialic acid. And we try to look why this is happening. And we try to look why because another kind of cells do that, have a, what's called hypersalylation. It's cancer cell. As I told you, cancer cells have high level of sialic acid because they want to bind to cyclic and evade. So at the beginning, we thought it must be like a danger signal, something happening in the HIV, but they know. What we did is we take an HIV uh, plasmid, uh, we infect the cells with the plasmid, there is high level of, higher level of sialic acid. So in the infection itself causing sialic acid. Then we trans, um, transfix the cells with every single protein of HIV. And we find only one protein is enough to do that, uh, which is uh, NIF. Only NIF will cause this sialic acid. So I, I, we don't know, we don't have an evidence of that, but it's something happened by the virus. We know that is every single protein in the virus do multiple things. We like to think that is one of the function of one of those accessory protein is to increase sialic acid in order to evade immune surveillance. The rest of the body is pro-inflammatory and the HIV infected cells is protected from the immune cells, which is like almost like a perfect case scenario for the virus. Well, that sounds like another nature paper coming. So uh, a quick, quick follow-up though. Do other viruses do this? Have you looked in other, other viruses? Do they have mechanisms? We didn't that? look at the cell surface glycosylation of other viruses, but we have looked at the IgG glycan. Uh, we know, for an example, HCV does that. We did the study. Uh, we did, ex we did uh, analyze sample from people with HCV and HCV plus HIV. 
And indeed, they do have a pro-aging glycomic alteration. In fact, actually, with Todd Brown now, we, we are analyzing a cohort of samples that I thought it will be very interesting to know now. Those people with HCV get cured from HCV. So what will happen after they get cured? Would their this glycomic alteration reverse, or that is just kind of like an, a permanent damage to the biological age? So we will know soon about that. Great, and, and we, we also have a question online from Steve Ugel. Steve, do you want to unmute? Hopefully we'll be able to hear you. Uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Um, uh, Mohammed, that was uh, a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, I'm particularly interested in the connection between the glycan and aging, um, both as manifested in the intestinal integrity and then the glycans on the circulating immunoglobulins. And you did sort of address this, but I'm, I'm wondering, um, if this is cause and effect and in what direction? In other words, um, when you get older, does this then lead to, uh, for example, uh, changes on your glycans, on your circulating immunoglobulins and your gut mucosal permeability, or is it the, the other way around? Um, uh, and, and how do you answer this um, other than you sort of mentioned longitudinal studies? I think it's yeah, yeah, Steve, uh, you're breaking up to, uh, the, connect the internet connection may not be great. Um, uh, but I think you're getting at cause versus consequence in terms of, um, you know, when, when people get older, it, you know, and, they, and you see these changes in the glycome that may be related to intestinal permeability yeah. is, you know, one, one can feed off the other, presumably, you know, if, um, absolutely. So do we know cause consequence? Uh, with the gut, yeah, as we're getting older, there is an decrease in intestinal, increase in intestinal permeability as people getting older also naturally. I like to think of these uh, biologically active molecule like glycans, metabolite, and whatnot, as um, usually they have a uh, two-way connection with inflammation. So inflammation happens, they cause glycomic alteration, and then glycomic alteration will cause more inflammation. So in this sense, they will be both a driver and a consequence as well. And then you will get into this vicious cycle where in more inflammation causing more alteration and so on and so off. But obviously it's very hard. We know some of, like for an example, we did identify some microbes to be enriched in the gut of people living with HIV that correlate with accelerated biological aging. You can take these microbes and you can culture them with immune cells and it would cause more inflammation. But that is not obviously a definitive answer to say that is what causes. Yeah, some of them are pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory, but, but yeah, it will be hard to unequivocally answer a cause or consequence question. Hey, Mohamed, great talk. Um, so I have like a, a two-part question. One comment first. Neff didn't need any more functions. It's okay. got enough functions. All right. Cool it with the Neff functions. Now the um the uh my two part question. So one is I was wondering if there's like crosstalk between the classical uh, immune checkpoint system like PD1, CTLA4, TIM3. Are these glycosylated in a manner where they have anti-inflammatory properties? So even in the absence of interactions with their ligand, they still um exert some anti-inflammatory influence, you know, is there a natural amplification there? And the second question I had, had was for the both of you. I distinctly remember you giving a talk, I think in this room like five years ago when you, you were talking about, um, uh, you know, HIV inflammation and, and aging. And for, for whatever reason, and I can't remember the definition, you, um, you were uncomfortable with the concept of the term accelerated aging. Mm -hmm. I think you were okay with advanced aging where, for instance, with your telomere length that the, you know, there's a, 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 an aberrant map between chronological age and a particular aging feature, but you were uncomfortable with the term accelerated. So I was wondering if both of you guys could talk about either of these things. Go ahead. I would just say the whole, the whole accelerated, um, the whole accelerated uh, versus accentuated aging thing. It's if you look at clinical events and people with HIV, they're increased at any given age. Um, it's not that the difference between HIV positive and negative continues to expand over time. So, so in fact, it goes the other way around. Um, as the risk in the general population goes up with aging, we see less and less uh, relative increased risk in the HIV population. So, um, uh, so, so I prefer accentuated aging, but the aging world always says accelerated aging. And so that's what everyone uses. So. I totally agree with even the glycan, actually our glycomic alteration reflects this. We thought at the beginning, we will see as people getting older, the gaps between the glycan and the people living with HIV will be higher, but that is the opposite actually the younger people, because maybe because there is some room 
in the body for biologically. So as you're getting older, it's actually normalized. And at a certain point, you will have a bias of like selecting people who lived actually for long and you will see double. But actually the people below 40, for an example, we, we have in the cohort of the Max and Ys, they show the most difference. So yeah, the terminology probably will, 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 will need to be accurate. And actually going back to your question, Satish, about the classic immune negative checkpoint, they are actually, they are the most glycosylated glycoprotein in, in the surface of T cell for some reason. In fact, if you try to do Western blot for tensory, you will not be able to unless you remove the glycan first. That's how heavily glycosylated in it is. It, is it. And there are several publications showing that is you will need to design a glycan aware antibody in order to increase the response of like anti-BD1 or anti-BDL1. And indeed, BD1, there is at least a couple of studies showing it have high level of focus, for an example, and if you will remove it, it will increase the function. So even classic immune negative checkpoints are glycosylated in a manner that is scanning back their function and their response to immune negative checkpoint therapy. Well, let's give a round of applause again for Mohammed. That was outstanding. Thank you so much. Uh, and so we're going to now move on to the next uh, phase of our uh, um, presentations this morning. I invite up uh, Don and Karina to. Or I guess. You use that. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you all for um, uh, attending the um, second um, annual CIFAR Scholars Symposium. We're so happy to see all of you here, and we're so excited to welcome our six amazing um, scholars to give their talks. Um, but before getting to um, our in uh, introducing the scholars and their talks, John and I just prepared um, a brief introduction to the program for those of you who are uh, uh, new to it. So... Um, so what is um, the CIFAR Scholars CDP program? Um, and I think it gets back to our kind of core priorities um, within the UCSF CIFAR and CIFARs nationwide in that um, really core uh, is mentoring the next generation of HIV researchers. That's a, a key priority that we see throughout our CIFAR. Um, and um, the, uh, with this, the NIH um, uh, developed this um, nationwide CIFAR program called the CIFAR DEI Pathway Initiative. And this is really to support um, ongoing or to develop new, new programs to um, enhance mentoring in the CIFAR network in collaboration with um, HBCUs and minority serving institutions. And the goal is uh, to support um, a pathway for future HIV scientists who have been historically excluded. Um, so that's the underlying uh, goal of the program. Um, so, um, sorry about that. And, and then um, we, um, there's a lot, I, I'm not gonna get too in depth into what the program is. We just wanted to highlight one of the publications. It's a supplement in JADES that will really highlight um, some of the detailed outcomes um, of, of the CIFAR CDP program as a whole, as well as um, our UCSF program. Okay, so here we just wanted to highlight the um, UCSF San Francisco State University team. Um, really huge um, shout out to Lauren and Joe, who are um, core um, to this program and really have kept things running. And we very much value all your work and leadership. Um, and then we, of course, want to thank Monica Gandhi for continuing to integrate um, mentoring and DI into the CIFAR. And then Audrey Paragon Smith from San Francisco State University and Jonathan Pukes. Okay, let me pass it to John. Great. And so um, some just brief uh, program details. What we do is we outreach to SF State to recruit undergrads and master's students, um, given obviously UCSF doesn't have th th those degree programs. And so really the gap was we're not potentially leveraging all of the access, uh, all of the opportunities um, that UCSF could provide to, to students from outside UCSF. So that's the gap we're filling. And this program is modeled after um, an R25 that me and Jonathan have that um, we just finished the 11th year in that program, and it's a, a summer program that runs concurrently with this, but how's the DPH? Um, and in that, that's also a 12-week mentored research program. 
Um, and so given, as uh, Karina noted, we have this robust mentoring infrastructure really developed by, um, uh, in, by Monica and Jonathan for many years. What we do is we um, identify these talented scholars who will speak and pair them with an HIV investigator to mentor them. We provide salary support to the mentors. Um, to develop an independent project, we develop a summer schedule of didactics and seminars from foundations of HIV to methods uh, from print science to public health uh, and everything in between. And there's tours. Um, a lot of clinical shadowing, which is great. And then um, these scholars get to work uh, and provide support to one another. But we also really want to shout out the mentors this year. Um, all of the immense work and hours they put into this, um, it's a labor of love. And, and we're just very grateful every year that we get um, these talented uh, mentors to be part of our program. And so with that, we also want to thank all of the folks, Caesar here at UCSF, our SHARP team, um, which are really, they allow us to leverage a lot of the infrastructure we've had over there. Um, all of the speakers, if you came and, came and gave a talk uh, to the scholars, we thank you. All the clinical consult uh, service folks listed here, UCSF Library for doing a, a tour of the history of AIDS and pulling out all the archives, uh, which is fantastic, SF uh, State, and then uh, NIAD. And so with that, we're gonna bring up uh, our first speaker, Miriam, whose title is talking racial and ethnic differences and preferences for delivery or prep among people at risk for HIV. Thank you, Dr. John, for the introduction. To add a little more about me, um, I recently graduated from SF State with a, <coughs> sorry, I'm short. <laughs> I recently graduated from SF State with a bachelor's in biology and a minor in ethnic studies. I'm an aspiring nurse practitioner and would love to continue doing research. Uh, I'm part of the SF State Build uh, research team for the app MA Squared, which is an app that we created to help students in STEM report microaggressions and affirmations to learn more about the disparities within education. Because I'm interested in learning about the disparities, this summer I wanted to learn more about the racial disparities within the HIV community. And let's get to the background. Here is a graph that I, that I created using data collected from the CDC in 2021, looking at Black, African, Latino, Hispanic, white, and other demographics, comparing new diagnosis for nationwide data in blue statewide data in orange and county data in green, specifically looking at Alameda County because our project is based there. There were 3,924 new HIV diagnoses in California with 157 of those coming from Alameda County. The biggest takeaway here is that over 75% of new diagnoses are non-white. Now when we compare to the PrEP uptake, we see a really different Nation and statewide, the lowest PrEP utilization is in non-white populations and known in local jurisdiction. So why could that be? Here is a word cloud that I've created using five studies around the globe that had participants explain some of the structural and individual barriers for their PrEP uptake. We saw lack of knowledge, lack of awareness, stigma, medical mistrust, access, perceived low risk, side, of, side effect concerns, cost, housing stability, privacy, PrEP efficacy, discrimination, just to name a few. So it was my objective to categorize the racial and ethnic differences in PrEP delivery preferences among individuals at risk for HIV in encampment sites and community centers in Alameda County in hopes to improve person-centered PrEP provision by informing providers of patient preferences. We had a parent study that was sponsored by the UCSF AIDS Research Institute to conduct a maximum difference study survey on preferences for health services on an HIV status neutral mobile clinic called the Hope Van. We had a total of 209 participants interviewed between June through December of 2022 in various community events and homeless encampments in Oakland, California. And here's the picture of our Hope Van. And from that study, we had 110, 110 participants who we use, well, I use a retrospective data analysis for the 110 participants from the original 209 using discrete choice questions and a little bit of overview on our discrete choice experiment. It was used to quantify preferences among different potential health care interventions. And the results are reported as preference ways and investigators can use those to help determine the relative importance of each of the attributes. We will be looking at the relative importance score. And here is an example of how our study looked like and the way that you look at this would be vertically. 
So for our demographics, we had 43 Black participants, 35 white participants, and 32 participants that identified as other, which could be American Indian, Alaska Native, Asian American, Hawaiian, Pacific Islander, and more. For ethnicity, we had 23 participants identified as Hispanic and 87 participants identified as non-Hispanic. We had female identifying participants as well as male identifying participants and non-binary identifying participants. So what did we find? Just as a guide, the solid rectangles are for primary preference and the dotted rectangles are for secondary preference. We're looking at four attributes, the dosing method, provider visit type, dispensing venue, and laboratory evaluation. Overall, the most relevant and important uh, attribute for the racial groups was the dosing method, as you can see in red. Black and other participants highly favored the daily oral tablet, as you can see in pink, while white participants favored the injection. However, they had a secondary preference of the daily oral tablet. All racial groups preferred having their pro provider visit with the van, as well as receiving their prep by van, with a slightly secondary preference for the pharmacy for white participants. They all preferred having their lab evaluation with the home kit, with a secondary preference for Black and other participants at the van. Now, when we're looking at ethnicities, this was for any race. The most important attribute, again, was the dosing method. Our non-Hispanic, uh, participants favor the daily oral tablet while having a secondary preference for the injection and our Hispanic participants favored the injection. They both favored their provider visit with the van as well as receiving their prep by the van. Our Hispanic participants had a secondary preference for the pharmacy as you can see in the dotted green and preferred the lab evaluation with the home kit with a secondary preference for both at the van, as you can see in the dotted light blue. So there are racial, ethnic differences, racial and ethnic differences in PrEP de delivery preferences. We saw that white participants primarily prefer long acting injectable PrEP, while black and other racial minorities prefer daily oral tablets. Hispanic Latino ethnicity preferred LAI PrEP. And these PrEP preferences may be influenced by the autonomy and empowered decision-making, medical mistrust, system level social and structural factors, And our findings show the importance of offering a range of mobile and community-based care options for delivering PrEP. People may be more willing to initiate and engage in treatments matching their preferences. However, there were a few limitations to our study. We had a relatively small sample size for certain racial and ethnic groups, and the, study, the survey was conducted in the presence of the mobile van. And the study was conducted in English only. But overall, PrEP preferences can support providers to culturally tailor messages and health systems toward community-based care and not use as race-based clinical practice. This person-centered care model has the potential to improve PrEP uptake and result of reduction of new HIV. And moving forward in a general direction, we can examine the PrEP uptake and preferences in different regions to co-create more inter interventions. We can also use qualitative exploration of data to understand contextual reasons and have more data collection, collection in local jurisdictions. Here is an infographic that I've, create, that I've created that depicts the main results that we had, mimicking the survey, looking at it vertically with the attributes to the left. And to conclude my presentation, I have a few acknowledgements I would like to say thank you to Dr. Natalie Wilson, my amazing mentor who pushes me to be my best, the participants, the HOPE team, my CIFAR peers, especially Brianna for looking at the data together, the CIFAR directors and Joe for organizing everything really well, my SFBELD mentor, Carol Umanazar, and the, CTC, the CTSI department at UCSF, which I work for with the most amazing and supportive team. That is my references. Thank you all for coming today and also joining virtually. And we can take questions um, in the room. I don't know if, there, if there's questions online, let me know. Uh, questions from the audience. That was really great. Um, I really appreciate that talk. I wanted to ask about um, long acting versus oral prep and um, 
you know, what your impressions are about if, if long acting can circumvent some of these barriers. You're asking long acting uh, inject injection? Yes. Okay. Um, honestly, I feel like the, like to understand this question better, I think the daily oral tablet is something more common within minorities because I feel like historically speaking, injections are just uh, were used in the wrong ways for some minorities. So I think that they're just not something that I can see being used. Yeah. So I think you're speaking to a lack of sort of knowledge and awareness yeah. and outreach to communities to mm -hmm. promote sort of understanding of the process. Yeah. yeah that's good. Um, I think question, Caravella. Thank you. Hi. Um, I really enjoyed this presentation and uh, I think it was really interesting to see that a lot of people are preferring the van site. Mm -hmm. um, not shocking though, but I guess I'm wondering like, what do you think is um, like the secret behind the success of the van? Like who's working there? Why do you think people prefer that? Well, not to be biased. So we have an amazing team and I've been on the, I've been on the van and it's very um, just supportive of everyone. We actually actually on the van last week and it was an amazing experience everyone was really kind everyone was willing to just you know not make it seem like a bad thing where I feel like our usual model is always go to the clinic right go get your medication at a pharmacy and not everyone is able to do that so a van is more welcoming because it you know invites anyone and everyone okay thank you Mary. Mm -hmm. So uh, we will bring up our next speaker here, which is Alexi. He's gonna be talking about the barriers of facilitators to HIV care engagement among trans women living with HIV in San Francisco. Thank you, Dr. Salceda for that wonderful intro. And thank you to everyone who is here today and also listening in virtually. To share a few things about myself, I am from Southern California, to be more specific, Montebello. A few of my interests are infectious diseases and mental health disorders, and I plan to continue researching within the public health and medical field. I also plan to pursue an MPH. My goal for the C4 program was to explore HIV research and gain qualitative analysis skills. To give a broad background on trans people, Research on trans people and their health needs are limited. To be more specific, current studies have shown that transgender women experience multiple health disparities due to stigma, discrimination, and unique barriers to accessing quality care. Of trans women living with HIV in San Francisco, the population estimate of those not engaged in HIV care was 14.3%. So the research question I came up with was, what were the barriers and facilitators to HIV care engagement among trans women of color living with HIV in the San Francisco Bay Area between the years of 2010 and 2012? My goal was to apply a thematic analysis to analyze qualitative data to better understand the barriers and facilitators to HIV care engagement among trans women with HIV. To compare these results with those from current studies, my study was a secondary analysis of qualitative data that were collected as part of the formative phase of the Healthy Divas intervention. My study had a sample of five participants out of 22 participants in total. To explain my inclusion criteria, the five participants were all adults, they were trans women living with HIV, and they lived in the San Francisco Bay Area. I use a thematic analysis to identify the common themes and barriers of barriers to identify the common themes and patterns of barriers and facilitators to HIV and care, care engagement that emerge repeatedly. Then I coded the data manually and broke it down into six core themes. To give context about the Healthy Divas intervention, it was funded by the National Institute of Mental Health. The data was collected between the years of 2015 to 2020, and it was designed to engage and empower transgender women with HIV in care and treatment. The intervention also consisted of six peer-led individual sessions. 
Moving on to my results, for the demographics of the five participants, two identified as Black, one identified as Latinx, and one did not disclose their race or ethnicity. All five women were housed and they were all on hormone therapy at the time. And all three, particip three participants disclosed that they were living with HIV for 10 or more years at the time, while one was living with it for more than 20 years, and one participant did not disclose the years they were living with HIV. I gathered six overall themes while analyzing the provided data from, from the provided data and separated them into two categories, barriers and facilitators. The main three themes for barriers were lack of representation, digital divide, and for the facilitators, for the facilitators, they, they identified as HIV health literacy, supportive social networks, and skills to handle discrimination. I will be reading quotes, so follow along. When asked about experiences of discrimination, a parent had to, I apologize, one sec. Hold on. Thank you. When asked about experiences of discrimination, a provider, a, a participant had shared that a provider had told them, quote, oh, I'm just tired of you kind of people. The participant stated that this was the most severe encounter of discrimination they have faced from a provider in the San Francisco Bay Area. When asked about the types of services and resources the trans population needs, a participant references to a specific LGBTQ plus center and said, it really doesn't have a lot of components for trans women of color. It actually has none. After being asked about how the participants felt about emerging technology, a participant stated that they don't have a way to get to emails. It would be nice if we were all savvy with technology. When asked about HIV health literacy, a participant shared that she did outreach to trans women struggling with addiction. She also stated, I'm pretty knowledgeable about my HIV. After asked how confident they are with their HIV. After asked who their main sources of support and info about HIV were, a participant stated, quote, a lot of information I've gotten was from the San Francisco's San Francisco AIDS Foundation. For the last theme, handling discrimination, the interviewer said that they were looking for some tips to handle discrimination to include in their peer sessions for the intervention. A participant shared their advice and they said, quote, remember, it's not you. It's that person having issues and you just happen to be there. Overall, Discrimination, lack of representation, and a digital divide were barriers that had a large presence throughout these interviews. The participants noted a lot of po positive factors that supported their engagement and care, such as being HIV health literate, having established support networks, and skills to handle discrimination. Some limitations I came across in my analysis were that the data were collected in a location where there is an advanced HIV care model. My sample size was very small, even for qualitative data. My last limitation was that there was a lack of diverse age group, which meant less of an opportunity to learn what barriers and facilitators adolescents face when being in HIV care. In conclusion, despite these limitations, this study provides important insights into the barriers and facilitators that trans women with HIV in San Francisco face, which allow us to increase viral suppression with within the transgender community impacted by HIV. I would love to give a huge thank you to my wonderful mentor, Jennifer Jane, Jay Savelius for providing the data, the CIFAR program directors, Dr. Salceda, Dr. Marquez, Lauren Sterling, and Joe Watabe for giving me this life changing opportunity, the amazing CIFAR scholars, thank you for being such amazing colleagues, and last but not least, thank you to the amazing women who participated in this study. 
Thank you. Great, thank you so much, Alexi. Um, we have time for a question or two. Jenny. Thank you so much, Alexi. That was a great presentation. I was wondering um, how your experience was working with qualitative data and if you can see yourself doing more qualitative research in the future. Yeah, thank you for the question, Jenny. I really loved my experience. I really loved my experience working with qualitative data. I think just hearing participants', participants experiences um, is very beautiful and it was a privilege. Um, I do see myself working with qualitative data in the future as well as quantitative data. Thank you. Monica. Um, that was very, it was just um, clear how compassionate you are and um, how loving you are in your presentation of that data. Um, I Thank did you. wanna actually ask about the current attack on trans rights in this country, mm -hmm. um, sort of the laws being passed against gender affirming care. And if that came up in your qualitative discussions about what it feels like in, in this sort of resurgence of these um, kind of hate, hateful mm -hmm. um, ways of, of, of legislation, um, if those came up that this felt like a different time. Right. Um, I'll try my best to understand the question. Very good question, Dr. Gandhi. When analyzing these interviews, they were from 2012. Oh, so sorry. I no worries, no worries. Um, so they were 2012. Very look, comparing and contrasting from current studies today, I think these women want the same or even more um, resources from interventions today. Um, yeah, I'm trying to understand your question. No, if, yeah, but there's just a huge difference from 2012 and today, yeah. for sure. And I think in some ways more challenging now um, than it was back then. Yes. Um, but thank you so much, Alexi. Thank Congratulations. You. Thank you. All right. Um, and so switching focus a little bit, I'm here to present uh, the next speaker, uh, Barbara, hold on, uh, who's gonna be giving a talk titled Metabolic and Fibrotic Shifts in HIV Diabetes Comorbidity. Uh, thank you, John, for the introduction. Um, all right, let's just dive in. So a little bit of background about me. I am a cell and molecular bio major, and I am also pursuing a minor in chemistry. I'm currently a third year student at San Francisco State University, and my career goals include obtaining a medical degree. I am interested in the integral role of pathology in diagnostic medicine and patient care. So prior to the program, I had no wet lab experience, and my goal was to acquire hands-on wet lab techniques such as RNA isolation and histological analysis. And my overall goal for the project was to gain a comprehensive understanding of current HIV research methodologies, treatment strategies, and challenges. Um, so so just, just going back to the research objective, um, we, were, we wanted to investigate the cellular molecular changes in adipose tissue in the context of HIV and we used RNA isolation, histological analysis, and glucose tolerance tests to assess metabolic alterations. So just a little bit of background. Um, so what is adipose tissue? Adipose tissue is a specialized connective tissue that stores energy in the form of fat, and it's involved in various metabolic processes. Its dysregulation can eventually lead to various health issues such as insulin resistance and type two diabetes. So why do we care about this? We know that HIV and ART have been linked to metabolic changes, which can induce tissue dysfunction. And we also know that the, tissue, the adipose tissue itself, it serves as a reservoir for the virus. And in addition to this, it can cause lipodystrophy, which is just an accumulation of fat or a loss of fat or even both throughout the body. And in addition to this, it can also cause um, ultra lipid profiles and insulin sensitivity. Our main issue is that HIV patients frequently ex exhibit changes in adipose tissue distribution over their body. 
and the mechanisms behind these changes are not yet well understood. So this diagram just points out the, the negative effects that adipose tissue dysfunction on multiple organ systems. Here in the cardiovascular system, we actually see um, an, an increased incidence of cardiovascular disease. And in the liver, we also have an increased incidence of liver steatosis and NASH, which stands for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. And in the pancreas, we have increased incidence of insulin resistance and diabetes. So for our sample collection, we were able to collect samples from consenting adult participants. And then we, after the samples were collected, we were able to extract RNA from adipose tissue samples using the Kyogen RNAZ kit. And then we were able to quantify those results using NanoDrop. And then after all that was done, we were able to do a histological analysis of the specimens. Here we have our um, RNA isolation slash nanodrop results. What I really want you guys to focus on is, um, where is the arrow here? Um, okay, I just want you guys to focus on those two numbers here in the middle, 260, 260 over 280 and 260 over 230. Um, so for our results, we actually did have quite a bit of contamination and we did have quite a bit of salt contamination, unfortunately, but that usually just happens with samples like this. They do happen to degrade over time. So, um, as for myself throughout the program, I have acquired a foundation foundational techniques in RNA isolation and histological analysis, which is essential if I want to continue further research in the future. Um, even with our limited data, the study still provides preliminary evidence that could contribute to better management of metabolic issues in HIV patients. Um, well, after, after the program, I also plan to continue my partnering um, beyond endocrinology and continue to investigate what my findings mean for viral persistence and reservoirs within the body. As for our limitations, our RNA quality um, actually suggests a potential for more in-depth genetic studies, as well as morphological changes in adipose tissue, which could indicate metabolic dysregulation. And another tiny, just tiny bit of limitation, we were limited by the scope of an internship project we did have a small sample size and a restricted time frame, and the lack of comparative data constrains the generalizability of findings. I would also like to take a moment to thank my mentor, Dr. Diana Alba, uh, David Barrios, and Stephen Mayfield from the Kaliwad Lab, all the CIFAR scholars and the CIFAR directory, including Dr. Karina Marquez, Dr. John Salceda, Lauren Sterling, and Joseph Watabi. Thank you, Barbara. Barbara was our, our lone um, basic science major joining us uh, for the program this year um, and got to work with Diana. So uh, questions for Barbara. I have a question, Barbara. So uh, could you, you know, coming in, uh, thinking about med school research, can you describe, you know, what you learned and how you plan to use that? as you pursue, I mean, complete your undergrad degree and then pursue advanced degree. Yeah, well, I mean, I was able to collaborate with a ton of different physicians on this project and they, well, I mean, they gave me like a lot of mentoring tips and I guess it, it just only really strengthened my, my need or want to actually go to medical school. And, um, yeah, it's been overall beneficial for my future career as well, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Barbara. All right, and shifting a bit, I think, Mark, uh, or sorry, I'll, I'll do this one. <laughs> uh, uh, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brianna Sanchez, whose title is Identifying Preferences for PrEP Among Individuals Who Use Stimulants in Alameda County.
Thank you, Dr. Sauceva, for that intro, and thank you all for being here today and everyone online as well. So to get us started, I will share a little bit about myself. I recently graduated from SF State with my degree in public health and my minor in Spanish. And my first exposure to public health has been volunteering at a student-run clinic based in the Mission District called Clinica Martin Baro, where we serve the Latino population there. And my CFR goals were to learn more about HIV preventative care and reducing disparities among marginalized and stigmatized communities. So just for some brief context on HIV and stimulant use, the rate of people living with HIV in Alameda County is 424 per 100,000 persons in 2021, which is higher than the national rate. And stimulant drug use is a risk factor for HIV acquisition as it can lead directly to acquiring HIV, such as injection drug use, and can also influence risky sexual behaviors, such as condomless sex. Stimulant use impacts healthcare delivery and access to HIV prevention, such as pre-exposure prophylaxis. And there is a high acceptability for PrEP among people who use stimulants, yet more research is needed to understand the best way to deliver PrEP. So let's take a step back and look at local Alameda County epidemiology to best understand trans HIV transmission rates by category. So here on the left, we have the transmission rates among cisgender men, blue representing male-to-male -male sexual contact, which is, the most pro which is the most prominent transmission rate within that population, followed by male-to-male -male sex male sexual contact and injection drug use, and followed by injection drug use. Here on the right, we have the HIV transmission rates among females, and heterosexual contact is the most prominent risk factor transmission rate and followed by injection drug use. And as you can see, injection drug use makes up a larger proportion of HIV transmission rates among this population. So now let's take a look at PrEP uptake in Alameda County. So there have been 2,508 PrEP users as of 2022, which is 109 per 100,000 residents. And a large proportion of PrEP users are 90% male and 9% female. And a large and the majority of PrEP users in Alameda County is 41% um, of people that are aged within 25 to 34 years old. Which leads me to my research question and goal. My research question was stimulant use is a behavior risk for HIV acquisition. Therefore, what characteristics of PrEP care services are found to be the most important among people who use stimulants in encampments and community events in Alameda County? Our goal was to identify preferences for PrEP type and program delivery among people who use stimulants to best reduce their risk for HIV acquisition. As for my methods, this was a secondary data analysis for a discrete choice experiment which was conducted to elicit preferences for PrEP delivery as part of a larger survey on preferences for the Hope Mobile Clinic. We presented four attributes and 10 choice tasks to participants. We did convenience and snowball sampling, and the Hope team approached participants based on pre-selected encampments and parks in the Oakland, Alameda County area. And we worked in collaboration with the AIDS Project of the East Bay and CalPEP. And our inclusion criteria was centered around whether participants answered yes to the question, in the last six months, have you used substances such as crystal, crack, or speed? So here is a description of the discrete choice experiment survey attributes of PrEP delivery. So we asked about preference, um, about their dosing method, um, provider visit type, the dispensing menu, and laboratory evaluation. So here are the overall demographics of our sample. Our total sample was comprised of 46% male, 39% female, and within ethnic groups, 39% were black and 31% were white, followed by 20% Hispanic or Latinx. As for people who re reported stimulant use, 58% were male and 38% were female. As for race and ethnicity, 52 were, were black and 27% were white, followed by Hispanic and Latinx at 19%. So now moving on to our results, we found that among the total sample, the dosing method was found the most influential attribute. 
with the daily oral tablet being the most preferred dosing method among, oops, let me see. Among the total sample followed by the LAI prep, which are similar preferences to those who did not report stimulant use. However, those who reported stimulant use prefer the LAI prep as their dosing method. So just to reiterate, among people who use stimulants, the PrEP dosing method was the most important attribute where they preferred LEI PrEP. And the second most important attribute was provider visit type where they preferred receiving PrEP by van. And the third most important attribute was the laboratory evaluation where they preferred getting their labs by a home kit. And the fourth most important attribute was the dispensing menu where they prefer to receive PrEP by van. As for our limitations, we did not differentiate between stimulants used, and we did not ask about different routes of administration, such as injection drug use. And our sample size was relatively small for a DCE. And to conclude, among a racially and ethnically diverse population with a high proportion of people who are unhoused, long-acting injectable PrEP is the most preferred dosing method among people who use stimulants. Improving access to preferred PrEP methods among people who use stimulants will be crucial to achieving the goal of ending the HIV epidemic. For future directions, further research is needed to see if PrEP preferences differ by race and ethnicity gender and stimulant type among people who use stimulants. And it will be important to make sure that we prevent disparities as we implement long acting injectable PrEP among this population. And I of course wanna give my acknowledgements to my amazing mentor, Dr. Jose Gutierrez, my CIFAR scholar program leads, Dr. Saceda, Dr. Marquez, Lauren Sterling, and Joe, and Joe Watavi the HOPE team, participants, and of, co and of course, the CIFAR scholars for being amazing. And that concludes my presentation and I will open the floor for questions. Thank you so much. We have time for one question, Elise. There's a mic behind you. Thanks, Brianna, that was great. Um, super important population. So I'm really excited that you decided to focus there. Couple of questions for you. One was um, I, during the presentation, you were referring to people who use stimulants. And then at the end, when you said um, the sample was small, you said it was 110. I just wanted to make sure, was your analysis only among the 36 who use stimulants or was it in fact among the whole 110? That's a great question. So as for people who use stimulants, that was 36%. But I, I did mention that my sample size was 110 since I did compare the the total sample, including the, including people who use stimulants and people who reported no to stimulants. But yes, um, 36 participants reported using stim stimulants. My, my other question was, um, so these are, if, if I'm not mistaken, these are all folks who came from encampments. Is that right? Correct. So this is, um, this is, it may not be generalizable to everyone, but this is super, super um, high risk population, not only people who use stimulants, but people who use stimulants who are also in encampments. And I'm just curious about some of the, like, how much of the outcome was really due to stimulant use and how much of it was due to people living in an encampment. And I'm wondering about um, the results that you presented seem to be about mostly about people who use stimulants and I'm wondering if you did any sort of comparing and contrasting to kind of get a sense of, is this really the stimulant or is this living in an encampment? That's a great question. And that's something I would like to explore since we just, since we are, since we asked the participants about if they were unhoused or not, and approximately half of our um, sample reported to be unhoused. So I would definitely love to look more into that and see that. Um, but as for people who use stimulants, they, really prefer the long acting injectable, but that's something I would like to explore as well. Okay, so for our next speaker, um, we have Erica Zambrano who will be sharing her talk, What are the Gaps? An examination of within group differences in prep knowledge among different racial and ethnic groups of individuals in substance use treatment. 
Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here today. And thank you, Karina, for that introduction. Uh, I'm going to start with a brief background on myself. I am a recent graduate from San Francisco State University with a bachelor's in science in microbiology and a minor in human sexuality. My goal is to continue to medical school following an MD PhD path in psychiatric medicine. Uh, I would like to continue my focus in research in trauma studies. And my goals for this program were to gain more experience in qualitative analysis, as well as gain some uh, professional confidence. So when we start looking at a short history of PrEP, we find that there is an array of health inequalities and disparities. In 2010, a randomized controlled trial found that Truvada reduced the risk of acquiring HIV. However, the study only accounted for men who had sex with men, and it took nearly two years for trials to be focused on women. Then in 2014, it was uh, the University of Northern Carolina predicted that women must take a daily dose of Truvada to prevent HIV acquisition via vaginal sex. And this was just not feasible for the women in the trial because the, it was focused on South African women and it just didn't fit into their lifestyle. And um, the most recent data in, on PrEP shows that there's, uh, it's not reaching the groups that we need it most. Uh, black people represent. Oh. Sorry about that. Uh, black people represent only 14% of PrEP users in 2021, and 42% of new HIV diagnoses in 2020. While Hispanic and Latinx people represent 14% of 17% uh, of PrEP users, and 27% of new HIV diagnoses. Um, these are just some examples of the disparities that exist across race. Uh, it's also found that substance use can, can contribute to the decrease in adherence to HIV treatment and prep, uh, prevention efforts. And this is where um, we can look also um, at advertisement then and now. When PrEMP was launched in 2010, it was targeted towards men who had sex with men. Today, there are more advertisements available to individuals of all races, ethnicities, genders, and sexes. However, use and adherence to PrEP is still low. In my talk, we will be focusing on the differences of knowledge in these targeted groups. So my research question began as, are there any differences in PrEP knowledge among racial and ethnic groups among people in substance use disorder treatment in Northern California? However, racial comparison studies often mask within group differences and make the assumption that white populations are the gold standard, which is why I wanted to have a more focused question that said, uh, what are the within group differences in PrEP knowledge across racial and ethnic minoritized groups of people in substance use disorder treatments in programs in Northern California? So for the methods, the data is from a large study examining technology use and interest in sexual health services among people in seven residential substance use disorder treatment programs across Northern California. This was a cross-sectional survey among the clients. The data was collected via site visits by research staff. Uh, participants reviewed the information sheet and then completed a 20 to 30 minute survey on an iPad via Qualtrics. They were then uh, given a $20 gift card for their uh, compensation. And it must be noted that this was a second day, my, my study was a secondary aim study using the data from the primary study. So the group, once again, the group of individuals surveyed in this study were individuals for substance abuse treatment programs. Therefore, many of the questions in the original survey focused on substance use. However, participants were given a section on sexual health questions related to PrEP. Um, these were the main questions that were asked. Have you heard of PrEP and what questions do you have about PrEP? Once the data was collected, it was analyzed using a logistical regression for racial and ethnic differences, and then analyzed further using a chi-square or Fisher exact test to explore the within group differences. When looking at the demographics, we see that our sample size was 157. Um, there were more individuals from different ethnic and racial groups, including Pacific Islander and, A and Asian. However, we were limited to three racial and ethnic minority groups due to the sample size. 
that we see here, it was uh, Black, White, and Hispanic. Uh, after controlling for age, gender, and sexual orientation, and substance of choice, we found that there was no difference in the odds ratio of knowing about PrEP. However, when we look simply at the percentages of individuals who responded yes or no, we find that there was an overwhelming majority that responded that they did not know about PrEP. So our first table here represents um, overall, it didn't account for um, a uh, race or ethnicity. It was just whoever answered yes and whoever answered no. For yes, it was 33.8% and no, it was 66.2. And this trend continued when broken down by race and ethnicity. Within group differences in areas of gender education and sexual orientation, um, this was for the white individuals. When looking at the white population in this study, we see that the p-value again did not have any significance in any category. However, it was surprising to see how low the percentages of individuals who answered yes were stimulant users or opiate users. And these are commonly use, used as injectable drugs as well as being associated with um, sexual risk behavior, which is why this uh, finding is so significant, we would want to target these populations. When looking at Black individuals, we see that, uh, once again, the p-value had no significance, but when looking at the within-group differences, we see that the percentages of men that answered no were three, uh, it was three times as many that answered no than those who answered yes which is an interesting difference. Within the Hispanic population, um, this was one of the only groups that had a greater percentage of answering yes. And these were individuals that identified as either being queer or part of the LGBTQ community. And, but it must be noted that due to the size of this sample, um, our findings did not have a significant value. Next, we wanted to know more about what these participants were experiencing. Therefore, we pulled some quotes from the second question um, where, they, uh, where they were allowed to ask, ask questions that they had about PrEP. As we can see here, we, have, uh, we had a total of 39 questions that were asked. There was a larger percentage of white women between the ages of 24 to 39 asking questions. Uh, one of my personal favorites was from a 57-year-old female that when asked, what would you like to know about PrEP, answered a lot. These quotes are representative of the individuals with diverse background um, and what they would like to know about PrEP. So for limitations in the conclusion, uh, for our limitation, we were limited by the sample size and seeing as this was a secondary aim uh, of a study, there was, uh, we could have possibly, if this was, PrEP was the primary focus of our study, we could have asked different questions and ensure that the sample size uh, was more focused, for example, going to possibly HIV clinics instead of substance use disorder programs. Um, so while we found no racial and ethnic difference in, differences in PrEP knowledge among uh, people in the substance use disorder treatment, our findings suggest that PrEP education and access could be integrated into these substance use disorder treatment programs. For the discussion, once again, our study found no differences in PrEP knowledge. But when looking at within group differences, there was also no uh, difference based on age, gender, or sexual orientation, or substance of choice. However, the overall knowledge of PrEP was low in all of the substance use dis uh, disorder treatment programs, which is 33% compared to the 66. However, these quotes will are also important because they suggest that people do have questions about PrEP. For implications, um, our findings suggest that PrEP education and access can be integrated into these substance use disorder programs. Uh, individuals who are part of these programs are at higher risk of infection. Therefore, being educated on the subject in these treatment centers can be a good way to disseminate the information. For future directions, future studies can be done to find if integrating PrEP education into the programs uh, will affect the, the rates of PrEP use and adherence. These are some of my references. And I would just like to acknowledge my mentor, who was amazing, Dr. Cavella McCauston and Jennifer Lee for providing me with the information. Our C4 team that works so hard. Thank you to Dr. Salceda, Dr. Marquez, uh, Doe, who was here very early working very hard, and Lauren and my C4 cohort. Thank you.
Thank you so much um, for that fantastic talk. We have time for one quick question. I, I'll, yes. Hi, thanks. I really just such an enjoyable talk and study. Um, I just wondered if you could tell a little bit about how you maybe a little more detail around your mixed methods analysis. In particular, I, I saw you put as an objective working with qualitative data, and I'm interested in what your analysis approaches were for working with that question. Yes, so for the qualitative data, I'm gonna turn to these tables very quickly. Um, so we used a, a chi-square, a logistical regression model using our uh, white population as a reference. Um, however, we didn't want to make a comparison between white and other uh, ethnic groups, the primary focus of this study. Um, and as a part of the question uh, for the reference, um, we, for the logistical regression, we were comparing uh, if people would answer yes as versus no. And in order to get uh, a more detailed representation of if this had to do with uh, what were the within group differences, this is when we uh, turn to a chi-square uh, uh, test. And that's how we ended up with our p-values. Um, however, we were, because of our limitations with the sample size, it was hard to get a significant value, which is why we turn towards uh, looking at the percentages um, rather than just focusing on the p-value. Okay, but that's fantastic and really um, great sort of presentation on the, the quantitative part and that the sort of some of the data from that other qualitative question. Thank you. Okay, so for our last talk, um, we have Fernanda Maya, um, who is going to present on self-perception and the transgender experience, resilience among Spanish-speaking transgender women. And Amaya is one of our master's students, our only master's students, so welcome. Thank you, Dr. Marquez, for that introduction, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and jump right into a brief bio. So I'm originally from San Luis Obispo, California, but have been living in the Bay Area since 2017 now, um, when I came to SF State to complete my undergrad degree. I'm currently completing my master's degree in developmental psychology, and some of my research interests include resilience, chronic health conditions, and human development. So jumping right into the background, transgender individuals experience significantly higher physical and mental health disparities at both interpersonal and institutional levels. Some possible stressors related to identity include transphobia, perceived rejections, and expectations of being rejected. And according to the model of gender affirmation framework, stressors, stigma, and social oppression may result in altered self-perceptions. Some may develop coping mechanisms uh, such as resilience as a response to the above mentioned struggles. So continuing with the background, when it comes to transgender women, especially in the context of HIV, we often see a needs-based analysis approach rather than a strengths-based. In needs-based analysis, objectives often link to health outcomes, and it also focuses on the, defi on the deficits, discrimination, and stigma create. In a strength-based analysis, however, it highlights how communities meet the challenges brought on by discrimination and stigma. This project aims to add to the growing body of strength-based research surrounding transgender individuals. So for my research objectives, uh, one of them was I really wanted to better understand how Spanish-speaking transgender women perceive and describe themselves and compare their chosen descriptors to the language often used in research. I also wanted to identify the relationship between the chosen descriptors and their experience as and their experiences as transgender women. So this project used interviews conducted through La Clinica in Oakland. And on the left of this slide, you'll see one of La Clinica's most recent flyers detailing the number of resources and services that they provide for both Spanish and English speaking clients. And on the right side are some recent promotional pictures of some of the beautiful women representing La Clinica. 
So interviews were conducted in the context of a long-term community academic partnership between La Clinica and UCSF. They were conducted in Spanish between February and November of 2022 with an experienced bilingual transgender researcher. The original study required participants to be over the age of 18 years old, self-identified as a transgender woman and fluent in either Spanish or English. And some criteria that I added for my specific project was that they answered the transgender experiences prompt and the five words prompt. Because this was a status neutral project, researchers did not exclude those who were HIV positive, HIV negative, or status unknown. And because the original interviews were also conducted with research aims surrounding practices at La Clinica specifically, not all interviews included those specific trans experience and five words prompts. Participants' demographics were also connect collected. Um, so the five words prompts asked, asked participants to describe themselves using five descriptive words. The transgender experience prompt asked participants to verbalize what being a transgender woman means to them. Interview coded start, coding started with sample transcripts while a codebook was developed. And once a sample codebook was in place, inter-rater reliability was established between Dr. Zamudio Haas and I, where we agreed upon what examples in the text would fit into each code. Coding took place primarily on deduce with a final group of 12 interviews that met the previously mentioned criteria. The main codebook consisted of participants who answered the five words prompts and individual words were coded under positive or negative language, internal and external descriptors and gender affirming language. Descriptors could fall into multiple of the codebook categories. For example, a word could be both positive and internal such as compassionate, positive and external such as beautiful or negative and internal such as bossy. Answers to the transgender experience prompt were coded under trans experience and participants mentions of experiences that promoted resiliency were coded under resilience experiences. These included, but were not limited to immigration, discrimination and health issues among others. Here are some of the main demographics. So starting with age on the left side, the majority of participants in the sample were between the ages of 31 and 40 years old, with the second largest group falling between 30 or 21 and 30 years old. Half of the participants listed Mexico as their place of birth, two listed United States, one listed El Salvador, and three declined to state. There were a total of 53 descriptors used across the 12 interviews with 39 being categorized as positive and 32 as internal. Positive and, inter and internal had the most overlap between two categories with 24 words shared. External descriptors were only used once uh, while negative descriptors were not used across the 12 interviews. This specifically showcases the contract between the tone of language used in research and the language used by the community themselves. So these quotes are in response to the transgender experience prompt, which read, what does being a transgender woman mean to you? These words were originally in Spanish, but were translated for this presentation. I decided to highlight a few key phrases in each prompt. The first being, it's a very sad life. It's very painful what I'm experiencing and I don't wish it on anybody. Another participant's answer to the same prompt read, for me, being a trans woman is everything. My transition has always been the most beautiful thing that has happened to me. These quotes highlight the contrast between experiences and further emphasize the need for research that depicts all aspects, not just the negative sides. They also showcase that positive internal self-perception does not necessarily translate into a positive and challenge-free experience. Despite the challenges many transgender women face, some are able to cope with the experiences of the transition and still perceive themselves as strong leaders and other positive internal words that were used. To summarize, for this project, I identified the relationships between self-perception and participants' experiences. I also explored the contrast between how transgender women perceive themselves and how research often presents them. The women interviewed were overwhelmingly more likely to describe themselves using positive internal descriptors, which does not reflect the language research often uses to refer to them. This study proposes an evaluation of the language that research uses when referring to transgender women in comparison to the language they use when referring to themselves. Some common descriptors in HIV research include language like vulnerable, at risk, and high risk, 
while some of the most common words used across our 12 interviews included leader, strong, and compassionate. One of the main limitations to this study was that there was restricted variability in the types of descriptors used throughout the interviews. Because there were very little to no external negative descriptors used, we were not able to compare these alongside the positive and internal descriptors. So in conclusion, in order to accurately and effectively reflect transgender women, we must bridge the gap between language used in research and language used within the community. Future studies should aim to assess why and how often transgender women are associated with statements of need and determine what outside forces such as access and social support need to be reevaluated to present them in a light in which they see themselves. Lastly, I want to acknowledge uh, my mentor, Dr. Zamudio Haas, and everyone at the La Clinica team and who worked on this project. I also want to, want to acknowledge the CIFAR team, um, Dr. John Salceda, Dr. Karina Marquez, and Joe and Lauren, and everyone in my CIFAR cohort. Thank you. Beautiful presentation. One quick question from anyone, and then... Sophia. <laughs> I could ask one here. Um, I, beautiful presentation. <laughs> that was really, that was so powerful. And um, I'm also just want to notice that you really focused on well being in that. How, I'm wondering how your research question might have evolved. <laughs> Thank you for that question, Sophia. Um, so, for those of you who don't know, I originally didn't come into this program. Um, focusing on things like the language used in research. I was really interested in resilience specifically, but once I started um, looking at the transcripts and everything um, alongside Sophia, uh, I developed a, you know, a bigger interest in what language was used and in bridging that disparity between the language in research versus the language that was being used by the transgender women themselves in the community. So through that, my question sort of developed and, um, I guess still kept re still kept resilience as an overarching theme, but um, I wanted to focus more on that language aspect. Thank you so much, uh, Fernanda. Thank you. So that concludes our uh, second annual symposium, and I want to congratulate all the scholars again for a fantastic set of presentations and all the mentors for your uh, hours and hours of dedicated support. Um, and I just want to say I think it's such a great opportunity to have, you know, think about undergrads doing research with data from CIFAR investigators uh, and, and the support that everybody here uh, provides. And so with that, I want to say thank you to everybody uh, who's part of the program and, and anybody who touched the program, we sincerely thank you for those efforts. I think Lauren, is there uh, announcements for next? Um, yeah. So for our scholars and mentors, if you could stay um, so we can take a few pictures. Um, Peter is going to lead the rest of you who are staying, who are joining us for lunch over to Pride Hall. Um, and then we'll just join you shortly. We're just taking pictures really quickly. Um, and thanks again, everyone for coming and, and being part of this program. Thank you.